If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4. We're going to be looking at the last section, verses 20 through 27, eight verses. I think we can accomplish that tonight. But I want to draw your attention to something while you're finding your way to that chapter. In these eight verses, at least 11 times, the body is mentioned. At least 11 times, the body is mentioned. And I want to read three passages of Scripture in our introduction the first one is found in Romans chapter 6. Paul says this, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Paul says we should yield every part of our body unto the Lord. And then in chapter 12 of the same book, he says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, I beg you, I urge you, he says, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So in chapter 6, he says you should yield the instruments, all the members, all the parts of your body unto righteousness in service unto him. Not to sin, but unto him. And now he says we should present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service, not some extraordinary thing. It's just reasonable. It's entry-level Christianity to say, Lord, I'm yours. This body belongs to you. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says in verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We should yield our body to the Lord. We're to present our body unto the Lord. And we are to glorify God in our body. And everything that we do should bring glory and honor to him. In this last section, the title of our study is How to Have a Healthy and Holy Life. How to Have a Healthy and Holy Life. And it involves our body. A lot of people just wish for a healthy life or they wish for a holy life. But unless we yield, unless we present, unless we glorify God with our life, we're not going to experience a healthy and holy life. So let's just jump right in, starting in verse 20. He says, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. The first thing we must have is a consecrated ear. A consecrated ear. My son, attend unto my words, he says. Incline, incline your ear, like stretch your ear out. Be attentive, be listening. Listen up is the idea. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. I find it interesting in my meditation of this passage of Scripture, the Lord took me all the way back to the beginning. He, he often takes me back to the beginning. Amen. And sometimes he goes even further than that. 
But in the beginning, the very first voice that Adam heard was God's. Imagine that. The first voice his ears ever heard was the voice of God. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the midst of the garden in the cool of the day. God made man. He planted a garden, placed man in that garden, and every single day he heard God's voice. That's the life that God intended for each one of us. A healthy and holy life requires a consecrated ear, an ear that is set apart to that which is holy. Jeremiah, speaking for the Lord, says, This people will not and cannot hear me, for their ear is not circumcised. The flesh, carnality, has gotten in the way of them hearing my voice. Apart from Eve, the second voice that was heard in the garden was that of the serpent. He slithered his way into Eve's presence and he says this, Hath God said? Now I'm going to say something right now that many of you might kind of step back and challenge. That's okay. There's still only two voices in this world. You say, wait a minute, Gordon, there, there are millions of people. There are voices all over the place. I mean, people are talking, social media, radio waves, internet. There's all kinds of voices. No, there's still only two. And you're, you're listening to one or the other. That's, that's it. You say, well, what about when, when men are speaking? They're either speaking God's language or the serpent's language. They're either speaking the truth, and truth is not relative. Truth is absolute. Truth is a person. His name is Jesus Christ. Or they're speaking some form or fashion of a lie. Something perverted, something twisted. Two voices. And if you're going to live, if I'm going to live, if we're going to live a healthy and holy life, we must have a consecrated ear. The first thing, the first thing man hears is God's voice. We make our way all the way to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation and Jesus is writing to his churches and over and over again he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. In John chapter 10, Jesus says this, my sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. And the voice of a stranger they do not know, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of a stranger. I'm afraid tonight that in many quote unquote Christian circles, they're listening to the stranger. They're listening to, Hath God said? Is marriage still what God calls it? Is, is life still what God says it is? Is eternity still what God says? Is there still only one way? Is there only two, male and female? And the church has bought into lie after lie after lie after lie. So how is it that we can consecrate our ear? We're going to have to learn to pray a prayer that a young man actually was a young boy at the time, Samson. He was taught a prayer. He heard God speaking, but he didn't know that it was God. He had not yet learned to discern 
the voice of God. And the priest says, the next time you hear that, this is what you need to say. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Your servant is listening. If you're going to have a consecrated ear, you're going to have to learn to pray that prayer over and over again. And as you pray that prayer, God's going to answer that prayer. He said, ask and you shall receive. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And you'll learn to discern the voice of God. And the more you hear his voice, the more you'll be able to recognize his voice. And you don't have to focus on all the other strange voices. Those who are experts in counterfeit money, they don't, they don't study all the counterfeit. They study the real. And if you know the real enough, the moment you see something that's not real, you'll automatically know that it's fake. So, so I would encourage you to lay your curiosity on the altar. Hath God said, and Eve says, well, you know, he, he, he said... Lay your curiosity down. Yeah, but Gordon, there's so much information out there. There's so much information out there. You don't need it. You don't need it. This is all the information that you need. This is all you need to learn to discern. I remember the first time, vividly, the first time I ever heard God speak to me. You say, well, Gordon, did God speak audibly? No. I've never heard God's voice audibly, but I've heard it within. And the very first thing he said to me, I was a teenager, not long saved. He said, stay humble and stay in my word. Now, when God tells you to do something, He's not just trying to fill up space. There's a reason he told this young man to stay humble. Anybody care to guess why? Because he had a pride problem. And there's a reason he said, stay in my word. Anybody want to guess why? Because I had a tendency to be lazy and not pursue his word. And so God said that I've never forgotten it over and over again I've been reminded of that moment as a young man the first time I heard I didn't have to go to the pastor and say hey I think God spoke to me I knew I knew I knew now there have been times in my life where I've I've asked that question Lord is that you my sheep hear my voice and they will follow me and the voice of a stranger they know not so when you know not, it's not God. Because when God speaks, even E.F. Hutton listens. Now, the older ones in the room will know what that means. The younger ones will be like, what did he just say? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. If you want to learn to discern God's word, his voice, you need to stay in his word. You need to meet with him daily and get back to his original plan for our lives, for him to speak to you daily. So you need to pick a garden, whether that's your front porch, back porch, the den, the kitchen table, wherever it is, you need to meet God daily and you need to pray this prayer. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, because your servant is is listening. In Isaiah 30, Isaiah says, you shall hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand or to the left. You need to, you need to, you need to learn to listen, Lord. Is this, is this what you want? Is this what you want? Is this the direction? What do you, what do you want? What are you saying to me? Consecrated ears. What would happen in your life if you decided tonight, from this moment forward, I listen to God alone. I can already tell you what would happen. You would live a healthy and holy life. A healthy and holy life. Life abundant. Just learning to discern the voice of God. 
verse 21. He says, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. A healthy and holy life. Just listening to God's word. I've heard testimonies of people who struggled with mental health issues. I think I could throw myself in that, in that category. Just allowing God's word, just listening to it, listening to it. You know, something troubles me, and I, I say it a lot, and, and I, I was kind of checked Sunday when I said it, and so um, we, we had a, a, a great time here Monday having a conversation about grace and truth, and I, I've, I've committed my life to teaching the truth, but I've recognized in that conversation that not all of my teaching of the truth was also full of grace. And so, so I'm asking the Lord to help me to not just be full of truth, but full of grace. But there is something that I want to say, but I want to say it graciously. It concerns me about the church. There's all of these voices, right? There's really two. But, but there's a lot of mouths mouthing the two original voices that man heard. Everything is, is trying to get your attention. And I, I did a little research, a little Google search. <laughs> Maybe some of you know, but I was shocked that the average attention span for adults is just a little over eight seconds. 8.25 seconds. That was in 2002. And the article said from 2000 to 2015, the, attentions, the average attention span dropped 25% in that period of time. We're in 2023 now. There's no telling what it is. A little over eight seconds. And do you know that the average attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds? <laughs> We're in information overload. Amen. Everything is vying for our attention. And I hear believers say, that message is too long. Worship's too long. We can't pray, pray that much. And I get it. Logic would say, as attention spans decrease, we must decrease what we do for the sake of those attention spans. But I don't go by logic. I go by the scripture. What needs to happen is the average attention span of believers should start increasing. Should start increasing. And the best way to do that is start listening to the Lord. Do you know that God is always speaking? Some of you are like, uh, God is always speaking. Remember, his original plan is to speak to his people every single day for them to hear his voice. Could you imagine how calming it would be to hear God's voice every day, to listen to his word? That's why I believe so strongly in a quiet time. I just read a book called Be Still. It's about quiet time. I would encourage you, if you're a book reader, even if you're not a book reader, get it, read it. Because it, it encourages us to get back to the garden, to just, to just sit. And now what I'm doing in my quiet time is I'm just putting in my little earphones into my phone. I'm finding a quiet place, and I'm listening to five chapters. I'm just listening. I'm just allowing God to speak. I'm not studying, 
I, mean, I might write a little something in my journal to come back to, but I'm just letting God's word flow into me. It's amazing. Some would say five chapters. That's a lot. It's not. It's not a lot. We, we, we need to develop our attention span. When is the last time, don't answer out loud, when is the last time you just sat quietly by yourself? Some of you are like, ain't no way, Jose. Why is it? Why is it that some of us struggle just being alone? I know why. Because of what starts happening here and where your mind starts going and what you're not happy about in here and what happened in the past. And as long as I can stay busy, I can stay ahead of it. I can outrun it. As long as I can keep the noise going, the radio, the TV, as long as I can just keep busy, I don't have to confront. But it was God's plan for you to hear him speak. To hear him speak, I, I encourage you. If you love the beach, go to the beach, get you a little towel, you don't even need a towel, you can sit in the sand if you want, just plop down, look out towards the horizon and just sit there. I don't like the beach, okay? Well then go to the woods. I'm scared of the woods. Okay, well, maybe you like to be around uh, semi uh, people, you know, related areas, go to the park. Well, I really don't want to go anywhere. Okay, go in the backyard <laughs> and just sit there. And after you've sat there for a moment, start praying this prayer. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What would God want to say to you today? And if that makes you afraid, you need to get to know your God more. Because this is a love letter to his children. I think you would be amazed at what God would say if you would just allow him to speak. He says, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, right? That's the idea, right? To, to hear and to let it get into our heart. How do we get it into our heart? Do it. Jesus says, take heed how you hear in the Gospels, and he says, take heed what you hear in the Gospels. And James, in James chapter 1 says, don't just be a hearer of the word. Because if you are, you're just deceiving yourself. Be a doer of the word. And so, so when I sat there this morning listening in 2 Kings, halfway encouraged and halfway discouraged because this king did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and followed after this king and not David. And Oh, but this king did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And I was like, yes, but he didn't take away the high places. Oh, and, and I'm, I'm, and then just listening, this is what I heard. Some of what these kings did was recorded, but there's something recorded about every one of them. Either he did that which was good, or he did that which was evil. And then I heard the Holy Spirit speak a verse from Ecclesiastes. Now let's, bless you, now let's hear the whole conclusion of the matter. To fear God and to keep his commandments is the whole duty of man, whether he has, his works were good or evil. And I realized at the end, that's all that matters. And my heart began to cry out, let me do that which is good in your sight, what is pleasing before you. Let it be said of me at the end of my life, he did that which was good. Oh, 
It's so wonderful to hear God speak. And then start doing it. And it makes its way into our heart. And look what he says here. Verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. If we're going to have a healthy and holy life, we're going to have to have a consecrated ear. But we're going to have to also have a clean heart. A clean heart. Keep your heart. Guard your heart. Now here's what's interesting about this concept. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? How can I keep my heart if it's deceiving me constantly? If it's desperately wicked, if I cannot know it, how can I guard it? Hebrews tells us the answer. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. It's sitting in God's presence, hearing his word this morning that caused me to cry out with the help of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I want to do that which is right and pleasing to you. Without that, I would have sat there this morning thinking, I'm doing pretty good. Especially when I look across the street over there at my neighbor. I've never seen him get in his car on Sunday and go to church. It's by being in God's Word. And God's Word discerns my heart. It's spending time with Him in my quiet time. It's, it's spending time like this in Bible study. It's, it's having conversations with your spouse, with your friend, with co-workers, with other believers, and allowing God's Word to check you, to convict you, to challenge you, to change you. Guard your heart. Because out of it flows all the issues of life. As I contemplated this, the Holy Spirit reminded me of this man, David, that we recently studied in, in the book of Psalms. He's called a man after God's own heart. And, and then he began to remind me of, of Psalm after Psalm after Psalm, starting in Psalm 19. David says this, Let the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto the O God. In Psalm 37, he says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, we, we tend to think he means, oh, well, goody, goody. If I just kind of throw a little delight his way, he's going to just, he's just going to heap me up with everything I want. I don't believe that's what the verse promises. I believe the verse promises, as I delight in him, he will give my heart the proper desires to desire. In Mark 11, Jesus says, Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Interesting that he says, whatsoever things you desire when you pray. It's in prayer that my heart is at its best. It's in prayer in his presence that, that my heart is, is guarded the most. And then in Psalm 51, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. And in Psalm 139, he says, search my heart, O God. And so we wonder, well, how did this man become a man after God's own heart? Well, he was constantly guarding his heart. He was constantly doing what the writer of Lamentations tells us. Let us lift up our hearts with our hands unto the Lord. Once again, just like, Lord, speak, your servant's listening. The same with the heart. Cleanse my heart. 
Lord, take from me, and the Bible warns of a, a cold heart, a hard heart, a double heart, a proud heart. I mean, on and on and on and on and on. The scriptures are, are warning us against these things. We need a clean heart, a clean heart, which, which carries the idea of being pure, not perfect, pure, unmixed, right? When Jesus talks about the sower and the seed, he talks about the different types of hearts. A hardened heart, right, that didn't have any root, uh, a heart that had all the weeds growing up, choking the word, all a cluttered heart, right? All of these types of things. We need a pure heart because Jesus promises this. Blessed are the pure in heart for what? They shall see God. So we need consecrated ear and we need a clean heart. Verse 24, put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. We need a cautious mouth. If we're going to live a healthy and holy life, we're going to need a cautious mouth. How many of you know that what you say not only impacts others, it impacts you? How many of you know we're going to get there when we study through Proverbs, if, if the Lord tarries, that the tongue has the power of life and death? The power of life and death are in the tongue. Now, some people have perverted that idea and they carry it to some crazy place that I ain't going where they think that they can just create just like God did and, and command just like God did and speak it, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, you know, that whole kind of thing. I don't believe that. The Bible doesn't teach that. But, but, I don't want to go so far to the other extreme that I lose sight of the fact that what I say can create an atmosphere where I live and where other people are. Because murmuring is contagious. Fear is contagious. That's why God said when men were getting ready for battle, if they were afraid to go home, go to the house. We don't need that. It's contagious. Murmuring, complaining is contagious. I've watched sincere saints be polluted by sourpuss saints. People don't think I'm listening. I'm always listening. I walk through the crowd and I'm listening to conversations. And what I want to do, I want to just stop, right? And, and I, don't, I don't want to acknowledge the one that's speaking. And I want to look at this person that's standing in front of us. You need to walk away right now. Walk. Walk away. They are polluting your soul. The power of life and death in the tongue. One of the verses that we mentioned in Ephesians. Well, we read it Sunday. We mentioned it Monday night in our conversation. That we should speak the truth in love. Speak the truth. Guess whose language that is? God's. When I'm speaking the truth, I'm speaking God's language. Everything that is not that, guess whose language that is? the dirty devils. We don't need to be talking like him. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. James says this. In James chapter 3, James says, Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. He says, If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. Interesting. Now we know that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And if you and I are struggling with self-control, I tend to think, based on what James says, victory in that area is going to start here. If you want self-control, but you're just just constantly, right? Like your tongue's loose at both ends and flapping in the wind of a hurricane. 
constantly. James also says, let every man be slow to speak. At least, well, how slow? At least slow enough for the Holy Spirit to convict you along the way. If you are talking so fast that your brain's not in gear, your heart's not in gear, and if the Holy Spirit were to say, oh, oh, you'd have enough time to hit the brakes. Have I surrendered my tongue to the Holy Spirit? I've often contemplated this. Many of the gifts of the Holy Spirit involve the tongue. Not just tongues, but, but, but many of them involve the tongue, whether it's the word of knowledge, of encouragement, teaching, you know, faith. All of these incorporate the speaking forth. So I wonder if it would be safe for us to say, if your tongue is not in control, maybe I shouldn't say that, then maybe you're not. Because if I can surrender this, no man can tame this, James says, but he does, but, but, but listen, he doesn't say God can't. Man can't. But God can. And that's why in Psalm 141, the psalmist says, put a watch over my mouth. And in another psalm, he says that he wants God to hold the reins of his tongue. Wow. Let every man be swift to hear, right? Let's circle back real quick. Consecrated ears, swift to hear. Oh, let's just keep circling, right? And, and a clean heart for Jesus is from the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. You see how all of this is connected together and why it's important for me to yield this body. It's important for me to present this body. It's important for me to glorify God in this body. He says, in Colossians, Paul says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you can know how to answer every man. I love that verse. Salt in biblical times it was used for different things. It was used for an antiseptic. And so our word should have healing property to it. Salt cause, causes thirst, right? And so the things that I say should cause people to thirst more for the Lord. Salt was used to preserve meat, to slow the decay and the rot of flesh. And so my speech at work or around my community should, should cause the slowing of that decay. I can remember as a, a young teenager in one of my first jobs, I was working at a department store and we were just kind of standing up at the front of the store before closing and turning everything off. And, and they were all talking. I was just standing there. And, and one of the young ladies, she was older than me that was working there. She says, she says, yeah, you know, I've slipped up around you and said some words, and it just always makes me feel uncomfortable. And I said, really? Why do you think that is? She says, I'm not really sure, but it's like if I were to curse in front of my grandma or something. Now, I don't think I looked like her grandma. Maybe I did. That's a poor grandma, right? But, but I think what it was was the Holy Spirit, my conversation my conversation compared to their conversation and it was obvious they knew that I didn't speak that language and so I stood out and when they spoke something different they were like ooh, uh, ooh, mm. I wonder how many people feel that way around me now I hope they still do I, I used to feel weird and I used to think well Sometimes I don't like being a pastor because people like weird around me. And then I realized that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. Because that shows that I'm spending time with the Lord. Because when, when Samuel made his way to the town where Jesse was, they asked, do you come in peace? Is it a good word from the Lord or not? You know, people sometimes act like I could just see right into their soul. I will have to say there are, there's a lot of times that God reveals the hearts of people to me. 
Not saying that to make anybody feel weird or, or to make anybody feel afraid, but, but there are times that, that I know who's coming before you ever get there. This is like the prophet I'm reading in, in Kings where, where uh, the prophet's sitting there and this king's wife disguised herself and as she walks in, he calls her by name. He knew who she was before she ever walked into the room. Ah, well, anyway. A clean heart, and then he says, a cautious mouth. Cautious in what we say. I want what I say to be a blessing. I want what I say to be encouraging. I want what I say to change people's lives. I want my, my words to be full of grace and truth. Grace saves, truth frees. And that's what I want to happen constantly. And I'm sure you do too. We're almost done, verse 25. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. If you're going to have a, a healthy and holy life, you're going to have to have controlled eyes. Controlled eyes, not controlled. Let them look right on. Let them look straight before you. How serious am I about where I'm going? See, people who are serious about where they're going, they don't waste time because they're trying to get there. People who are not in a hurry or not serious about where they're going, they lollygag and they're over here and then they're over there and then they're over here and then they're over there and then they're over here. My grandfather had, had a farm in Alabama years ago when I was a kid. I used to love to go to that place and, and just walk in just dark, rich dirt this deep, you know, just, oh, it was just, he planted peanuts and potatoes. I mean, he had it all, right? But, but when he would plow the field, he would pick a place out on the other side of the field, way out yonder way, right? And, and so that he could keep a straight row. Because if you're, if you're doing this, how many of you ever got distracted on the road and all of a sudden you hear, right, right? Then you realize you're driving by Braille, right? You are no longer looking where you're going, right? That, that, that's there to let you know you're about to hurt yourself. You need to look straight ahead. Hebrews 12 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And see, here's what's interesting. You, you, you tend to become what you look at. That's why in 2020, I was a mess because I was looking in the wrong places. I wasn't just looking in the wrong places. I was listening to the wrong thing. And the things that I was looking at and listening to started affecting my heart. And it started affecting all of my life and my walk. It matters where you look. It matters. That's why Job said, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. Jesus said this, if, you're, if your eye be single, your whole body will be full of light. Your whole body will be full of light. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? No. What are you looking at? We ought to be looking to Jesus. That's what we should be looking at. Not looking around at other people. We do that far too much. Either to judge them or to compare ourselves with them. And that's all I'll say because we're going to talk about that Sunday. So, or we look inward. We're a society that's just so self-absorbed. We're just constantly looking inside of ourselves, psychoanalyzing ourselves, and we're the greatest generation of depression. We're the greatest generation of anxiety. We're the greatest generation of mental health issues because we're so self-absorbed. Stop looking at yourself. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. And... A lot of people in the church are too busy doing this. Looking back. 
looking back. They're stuck back there. Psychology will ask you to lay down on the couch and go down memory lane. Now, I'm not saying there's not a time for that because I believe you should take a stroll down memory lane with Jesus Christ and then turn around from your beginning and walk back to where you are and then let that go and move forward where he wants to take you. But psychology wants you to just stay in the past, stay in the past. Did your mama love you? Did this happen? They, they always, always want you back there. Paul says it like this. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We become what we look at, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory. If, if you're constantly watching Elvis, it won't be long you'll be saying, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, if you're constantly watching Michael Jackson, it won't be long you'll be like, hee, hee, hee. You know, you'd be doing that kind of thing. We become what we, we look to. So if you want to be more like Jesus, you need to study him. You need to look to him. You need to keep your eyes focused on him. Jesus says, whoever looks back is not fit for the kingdom. And he says, remember Lot's wife. Don't be salty. <laughs> Verse 26. Ponder the path of thy feet. And let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Lastly, a careful foot. A careful foot. We talked about this. We're not going to kind of spend a lot of time in it. We talked about our walk last week in our study. But, but I want to draw your attention to a few things here. He says, ponder the path of your feet. You should have a planned path a planned path you shouldn't just be aimlessly walking along <laughs> it's a planned path what do you mean Gordon well number one it's ordered already Psalm 37 the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord and he delighteth in his way ordered steps all I've got to do is just step in the steps that are ordered for me, right? Not only are they ordered, they're ordained, Ephesians 2.10. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And they're oversized. The psalmist says, he's enlarged my steps that my foot did not slip. I don't have to go, uh, 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 uh. no, he's enlarged my steps. I can, I can just step. I'm always encouraged when, when I'm reminded of what God said to Joshua, every place the sole of your foot shall tread, I have given you. Why am I walking all, uh, uh, is this the right way, Lord? Uh, 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 uh. No, that's not what I mean by a careful foot. A careful foot is, I'm just careful that I'm walking in the steps that he wants me to walk in. I'm not living in fear. I'm not walking on thin ice. I'm not worried about breaking the ice. I'm confidently following Jesus. So it's a planned path. Look what else he says. Ponder the path of your feet. Let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or to the left. It's a plumb path. It's straight. Straight. It's not... It is straight. Jesus says straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. I don't have time to turn aside. If you want to turn aside, go on and do it. You'll be playing catch up. I'll hear you in the background. Gordon, wait up. I ain't got time. You better bring your A game, because I ain't slowing down, baby. 
I ain't slowing down. I ain't turning to the right to the left. I'm trying to get to where he is. And I ain't wasting no time doing it. Right? It's, it's a plumb path. I'm, I'm walking straight. I'm not, I'm not getting extra miles doing this. I'm about to go on a trip, and I'm going to be doing this all over the place. But that's not how my life's going to be. Right? It's straight. It's straight. And lastly, he says, remove thy foot from evil. It's pure. It's a pure path that he leads me in. I'm not going to get involved walking in the midst of some junk. How many of you have lived enough in junk that you're like, I'm done with that? I ain't got time for that. It's a pure path. It's a pure path. So there you have it. This is how to have a healthy and holy life. It starts when I yield my whole life to the Lord, when I present my body a living sacrifice to Him, when I seek to glorify Him with what He has purchased. I am His. I have a consecrated ear. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I want to hear your voice every single day. A clean heart. Lord, create in me a clean heart. I don't want it mixed with this and mixed with that. And I don't want it divided. I want to love you with all of my heart. With all of my heart. Anybody remember what the third one is? Yes. Ooh. That's, that's encouraging. A cautious mouth. Right? What I say. I, I want to say what I'm hearing and what I'm hiding in my heart. If, if what I'm hearing and what I'm hiding, it's going to come out. So you, you can know, you can know if, if you just sit around and listen to me long enough. What about the fourth one? Other than the smart one in the room, is there anybody that's smart in the room? Yes. A controlled eye. We got a lot of smart people here. A, a, con, a controlled eye. What else? I heard it. I think I heard it. Don't be shy. Step out there. Careful foot. How many did we say? Was it four or did we say five? There's five of them. We said five. You got it. Now all you got to do is go enjoy a healthy and holy life. Let's pray.